Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jay Michaels again, and here we are at the fourth folio. Now, I suddenly discovered this is what our half dozenth episode already. We've covered a nice piece of Shakespeare's canon, and it suddenly dawned on me. I've never explained why the name of this program is the fourth folio. Now, in the days of Shakespeare, when they would do an anthology version of his plays, they were called folios. It really was basically the way they printed it and the way they folded the paper to create it. So the notion of folio was a technical term. But we as, as a society, if you will, refer to the first or second folio when we're talking about Shakespeare, the first or second anthology of his plays, where we get the notion of 36 and 37 plays. But in my travels, I discovered there was a fourth folio. Now this folio, one might think is just another printing, but it contained over 40 plays in it. Plays such as Cardinio, plays such as Two Noble Kinsmen making its appearance in there, plays such as a Yorkshire tragedy. And my mind exploded. And I thought, why are these plays attributed to William Shakespeare? And it got me thinking and researching and I discovered there's a Shakespeare conspiracy. There's an authorship question in which people are claiming that Shakespeare may not have written some of his works, all of his works. He may have had colleagues write with him. And, and it blew my mind again. I thought, wait a minute, no other author. Ben Johnson was the poet laureate of the time. Why, why aren't there uh, 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 other folios of his work? There are also bad quartos of Shakespeare. There's a bad quarto of Romeo and Juliet and there's a feigned bad quarto of Hamlet. And I'm thinking again, why isn't Christopher Marlowe getting a bad quarto of the Jew of Malta or Faustus? And it really set me thinking. Now, years ago, I did this project called The Fourth Folio on stage, and I had the pleasure of working with my colleague, Rodney Hakim, the smart one of the two of us, <laughs> and, and, he, uh, and, and joyously, uh, we examined many works at that point. Uh, now we have this, this wonderful, this wonderful notion of Zoom, and we're able to not only speak to a wider audience, but we're able to speak to scholars and, uh, and individuals who have researched and, and uh, elucidated audiences and, and readers with their work. And, and so I am now properly intimidated by our guests today, and, and I'm intimidated even more. Love's Labor's Lost is one of the few comedies I don't know a lot about. I do know it, but I don't know enough about. So, so I'm going to be the student this time around, and I can't wait to hear from our two distinguished guests and from my distinguished colleague, all about this really fascinating play that when you really get down to it, it, it actually has a little bit of a twist of the little rascals in it. Uh, <laughs> Rodney Hakim, thank you for joining us again. Uh, uh, how are you? I'm doing great, Jay. I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here again and to join you on yet another journey into the fourth folio. As you said, we did this uh, many years ago in the theatrical scene in New York. And uh, in the past year or so, of course, because of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the theatrical scene is, uh, has radically shifted so that everything is being presented uh, for the most part online on Zoom and YouTube and Facebook and other digital formats. Uh, so it's been a, a real joy to reconvene our work on the fourth folio and to examine once again, uh, many of these plays in perhaps in greater depth than we did at that time and with uh, many distinguished guests whom we uh, are very happy to have join us. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Rodney Hakim. I'm the voice behind the New York Shakespeare social media feeds uh, in which we try to capture as much as we can about what's going on in the New York scene as it pertains to Shakespeare. Whether that's theatrical performances, book readings, film screenings, or whatever else, you can go to NY Shakespeare or New York Shakespeare spelled out on social media and you can find all of that content. And tonight, He's being very humble. Uh, <laughs> New York Shakespeare has an awards program where they have just right. uh, honored several companies. They have been around for a very long time. He has chatted with the creme de la creme of New York Shakespeare, as well as Shakespeareans from around the world. So, so when Rodney talks about the Bard, you listen. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And you're no, uh, you're no slouch yourself, sir. Uh, for those who don't know, Jay Michaels, my colleague here, uh, has been uh, producing, directing, presenting, performing Shakespeare in New York and around the, the New York area for, oh, many years now. And he's probably presented, uh, if not in the scores, then in the hundreds 
of uh, different variations of Shakespeare in that time, both on stage and on screen. So um, I'm always uh, uh, humbled by your presence, my, my good friend. And uh, tonight we are humbled by two uh, other wonderful guests we have uh, with us, uh, Jillian Keenan, who is a noted author, uh, who was for many years based in New York and who is the author of the book, Sex of Shakespeare. Uh, hello, Jillian. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about Love's Labor is Lost. I think it doesn't get enough attention. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So in addition to Jillian, we have our other wonderful colleague, and that is Victoria Ray Sook of the theatrical group, the multi-time award nominated and recently award winning Food of Love Productions. Hello, Victoria. Hi, it's nice to talk with all of you. I'm so excited to talk about Food of Love, uh, Food of Love and Love's Labor's Lost because Love's Labor's Lost was our very first show. And Love's <laughs> Labor's Lost, before we go any further, uh, I wanted to let the audience know in case they haven't been uh, in, this, in the New York scene for the last couple of years, Love's Labor's Lost was one of the big hit productions in New York for a, a good stretch of time. And you guys were uh, running mm -hmm. off Broadway and you ran for, I think it was six months or so, right? Was. Yeah, we ran for six months and, uh, that, and that was just our commercial run. Uh, we started in 2016 in a living room, actually, in my living room, much to uh, my brother's <laughs> chagrin. He was my roommate at the time. <laughs> and uh, then we ran off Off-Broadway for two months and then we got picked up by a producer. And that's how actually like Food of Love became what we are now is we had that six month run Off-Broadway. And that was a very, very uh, well attended, very well regarded production. Uh, you had multiple nominations. What were just just a couple of the nominations that you had for that uh, that run, Victoria? So uh, it was uh, audience immersion and um, best theatrical experience by a few different um, organizations, most notably the Drama Desk Awards. Right, fantastic. Oh. And and Victoria uh, is not mentioning. Uh, I, I'll throw it out there for her that. Uh, as Jay mentioned at the top of the program, uh, that with New York Shakespeare, we at the beginning of the year, we did our roundup of all the theater that we saw in 2020. And we uh, gave awards in different categories for whom we thought were the creme de la creme of, uh, of what we saw in the past year. And Victoria's production of Twelfth Night was our winner in the comedy and romance category. Uh, yeah. So she is our award winner uh, there. And uh, we're very happy to have both her and Jillian with us here tonight. Okay. Very to be here. Happy to have you. So uh, as we have introduced all of our participants, uh, I just want to take a moment and say uh, that if you look at where we are uh, right now, we uh, in our last discussion, we, we spoke about the play Coriolanus. We talked about how uh, it was very reflective of the moment that we are in in the US right now, where we saw the uh, a very popular leader who was at the apex of society, who had the, the love of the populace, the support of the populace behind him, uh, all of a sudden saw that uh, erode and disappear. And all of a sudden he and the populace uh, were at odds with each other uh, when he uh, was no longer in charge. Uh, and we see some reflections of that in the transition between uh, Trump and Biden right now, depending, and it doesn't matter really which side you're on in that, uh, we're not, we're not them taking into a political direction, but just to reflect what's happening in society right now. And if you keep on going with that, that kind of leads into our discussion of Love's Labor's Lost tonight. And I didn't say that very well. Love's Labor's Lost. In that, uh, that play is also one in which we see uh, transitions in leadership. Uh, and we're also a couple of weeks removed from Valentine's Day, and that's uh, coming up in just two weeks. Uh, and Victoria and her company have uh, some, what do you have coming up for uh, Valentine's Day, Victoria. So um, thank you for asking. We actually, because you can't really go to a performance right now and we had planned to open a show actually this coming Valentine's Day, but instead we have, you can have one of our actors send a sonnet to oh. love or you can um, purchase it together complete with, um, so we're, our company, if you're not familiar with us, we use food and smell and taste as one of the points of immersion. Our, all of our shows are immersive Shakespeare. So you can get a sonnet can, um, complete with a recipe that is inspired by the text of the sonnet. So you get one of our actors performing and we have actors from Love's Labor's Lost, from the Twelfth Night Mentioned, and from our production of Midsummer Night's Dream. You get to pick the sonnet and then the recipe, we have some um, brookies and I think it's the, uh, this raspberry cookie inspired by the bitter words of one of the sonnets. So if you go to our website, you can see in there available for 
for purchase starting on February 1st uh, throughout the entire month of February. And you get a full performance and, and little sweet treats. And there, I love that uh, so much. That's so cool. <laughs> Food and Shakespeare, like what could be better? Indeed. Well, in, in that vein, we also have the, the wonderful Jillian Keenan, and she has a book that is very apropos of Valentine's Day. She has Sex with Shakespeare, which is all about Shakespeare vis-a-vis -vis love and sex and uh, different kind of uh, levels of intimacy. And it's a wonderful book. It's also a wonderful listen. You can either buy the book in uh, printed form or I was listening to, to it today uh, as an audio book. And that's uh, equally good. And that's narrated uh, or spoken by Jillian herself. Uh, Jillian, uh, tell us a little bit. Yeah, about I have book. to admit my book is not about Shakespeare and food, but it is definitely about Shakespeare and appetites. So <laughs> maybe Victoria and I are uh, not so disconnected after all. You, you both come to to uh, Shakespeare with uh, some kind of uh, immersive element to it. Uh, so, uh, Jillian, where can people find uh, your book if they want to check out Sex with Shakespeare? It's on Amazon.com and wherever major books are sold. Um, I'm always supposed to say, uh, give a shout out to independent booksellers. So if you have the chance to buy it from an indie bookseller, that's always a good thing, especially these days when businesses are suffering so much. All right. All right. Hint, hint, Shakespeare and Company. <laughs> okay, so uh, we will begin. Jillian, I, I, I have to tell you, I am so happy when I saw, uh, w w when I, I found about your book, because I have always contested that Shakespeare's dirty. You know, people- Very, people, very dirty. <laughs> people think he's stuffy. I, I, I teach- I teach in university and so many times I will say Shakespeare and immediately every student thinks they're now about to enter into an encyclopedia and something so stuffy. No, no, no. He is dirty. He is scary. He is profane. He would be so edited these days. And I'm so thrilled that you've reached the topic with your book. I couldn't and, and agree more. One of the uh, funniest memories of my early career is I went through a period of a few years where I was in, being invited to give talks about Shakespeare at schools around the world. And at one point I was invited to give a speak, uh, a talk about Shakespeare at a rather, let's say a Catholic boys school in a rather conservative country or a country that is often stereotyped as being uh, very socially conservative. And um, before I gave the talk, I was very direct with the um, teacher of these high school boys at this Catholic school that I was going to be very direct about the sexuality of Shakespeare's language, which included some, uh, let's say eyebrow raising terms. And the teacher said, yeah, it's fine, go for it. And that's why at this conservative Catholic boys school, I got to write the word cunt in big letters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I tell my I tell my students all the time. I tell fellow actors all the time. I say the worst curse words we know were started by Shakespeare, and they yeah. all sit there and scratch their head. Thank you. You spoke. Yeah, I was of course now. referring to the moment in Twelfth Night, which I'm sure you know, Victoria, uh, about her C's, her U's, and and her T's. <laughs> and, you know, he wrote it, not me. Can't blame me. <laughs> And I have to tell you, uh, I was uh, listening to uh, Jillian's book today. I, I spend quite a bit of time listening to it today. And it's a, it's a really, it's a wonderful book. It's very well written. And it's a great, great entry point into Shakespeare because uh, Jillian will start, to, she starts the book uh, with her own experience, uh, talking about her life. Uh, and then it goes chapter by chapter or scene by scene, act by act, uh, mimicking Shakespeare's uh, structure. Uh, into a different Shakespeare play. And for each Shakespeare play, she connects it to an experience in her life that mimics or in some way uh, parallels the things that are happening in that play. Uh, the sexuality, the intimacy, the love relationships, the gender uh, conflicts, a, a lot of, it's a really, really wonderful book. I, I highly encourage you all to check that out. Excellent. Well, thank excellent you, Rodney. Book. I really appreciate that. I know what to get my fiance for Valentine's Day now. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, Victoria, I was thinking the same thing when you talked about the sonnets with recipes. I was like, oh, Valentine's Day idea. <laughs> uh, I know who will be changing, exchanging emails after <laughs> yeah. this program. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, Jill, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Victoria, why don't you uh, give us, uh, for anyone who is watching who is not so familiar with the content of the play, why don't you give us just a quick summary of what Love's Labor's Loss is all about? Fantastic. Yes. So, the show starts off with the silly boys doing what silly boys do, and they decide to um, make a pact with each other. There's the King of Navarre and his four bros, sorry, rather three bros. There's four of them in total, and they decide. Um, 
in order to get really smart, they're going to swear off women so it doesn't distract them from their studies. And so they make a pact and Brune is like really, he doesn't want to do it, but they talk him into it. And they all just decide that they're gonna do this together. And that the only entertainment that they're going to have is Castard and uh, Don Armado. They're these two kind of, they're the clowns of the play. And they're like, okay, we can do this, it's fine. Then um, Don Armado, uh, catch, he's in love with this woman, Jacquinetta, and he catches him fooling around uh, with Castard. And then Castard has to go to prison. But he's like, oh, well, I'm going to send a love letter to Jacquinetta. And naturally, the best person to deliver this letter is um, the person who I caught him fooling around with. So I'm gonna get him out of prison uh, and get him to send the letter and kind of just be my um, be my servant. So then, then we have Don Armato and Castard hanging out to send this letter. So another thing happening at the same time as that is the women from France have arrived. Um, we have the princess of France who doesn't get a name by the way, but we can talk about that later with her three ladies. <laughs> all show up on an errand from the king of France because the king of France is homesick because they have to talk about some political things dealing with Aquitaine. They show up and naturally, just as they've sworn off women, all of the four ladies fall in love with all of the four men. And sorry. Don't you hate it when that happens? Naturally, <laughs> waka waka. And so all of the fun and games ensue, especially when Baroon finds Castard and says, hey, can you send this letter to this lady? And they switch the letters. And that's a really fun part of the play. I think most of that is like most of what happens um, that's really important to know about the plot before we get into it. Um, and, oh, oh, oh. So then the, the men are like, let's decide. There's this really, really special scene where, because they decide not to tell each other that they um, have all fallen in love because they can't break their pact and they gotta impress one another that they are all holding off. Um, but that they all find they all find one another out like little by little. And then they have this duel about like, no, I didn't break the vow, you did, ha ha ha. But then they find out. So then when they finally decide to woo the women, they are gonna do it in disguise as Muscovites, which is a Russian. Um, but they never say that in a play. So if you don't know that, you're really confused. So <laughs> then, but the ladies find this out first. So then they decide to dress up as one another. So then when the men come to woo them, the men all woo the wrong ladies. So then the men come back dressed as themselves later. And they're like, did you see any cool guys here? Like, no, but we saw a bunch of assholes dressed like a Russian. <laughs> <laughs> and then the men are like oh what what you talking about and they're like no it's fine it's cool don't worry about it we saw you we like you let's all have fun then the Don Armado I was talking about he comes on and he's like wouldn't it be awesome if we put on a play within a play for all the lords and ladies now that they were fallen in love kind of like mechanical ass like we could be made men um and then they just go they put on a play then a messenger from France shows up, spoiler, love's labor's lost, and says, princess, your father's died. And they have to go back to Paris. And then the men are like, we'll marry you. We'll come with you, ladies. And they're like, we saw how good you are at vows because you just broke the <laughs> vow you made. You <laughs> made a year later. And that's the end. Is she cliffhanger? Cliffhanger. Is it right. me or am, am I listening to an episode of The Little Rascals? Right. <laughs> it's, it's the it's, Even it Woman good. Haters Club. And then Alfalfa is going to wear a fancy mustache and bowler right. hat and stand on, on, on somebody's shoulders and wear a coat. And then they're going mm -hmm. to put on a play after school for, for, for Spanky and Petey and all that. I'm, right. I'm watching Little Rascals. I I see it, it's big, fuzzy beards and very sweaty actors. Of course. <laughs> of course. And of course, there's mistaken identity. What Shakespeare comedy wouldn't be a comedy without, oh, look, you're wearing a hat, so I don't know you're the same person you were in two scenes before. So, Jillian, you, you spend a, a, a big chunk of time in your book uh, about uh, talking about Love's Labor's Lost. Uh, what do you make of the... Uh, 
the four sets of lovers. And we see that, that relationship in other plays also where there's multiple sets of lovers and they, they all end up together at the end. But what is it about this play and the, the four lovers in this play that, that really uh, stands out to you? I don't think it's the sets of four lovers that I particularly responded to. I think that that's a pretty common trope throughout the Shakespearean canon to kind of line up uh, men and women like dominoes and, and have them fall over each other. Uh, but what I really responded to in Love's Labor is Lost is the very explicit way Shakespeare addresses this idea of choosing to be celibate, choosing to be sexless or asexual or however, however you want to put it, um, and how a sort of futile a goal or resolution that ultimately is. All right. And uh, in your book, you, you uh, as I mentioned earlier, you go through each chapter and you uh, reference what's happening in your life at that time. And then you connect back to, uh, to the, the parallelism with what's happening in Love's Labor's Lost. So did you have three friends that were all in love with the four other boys at the same time during that period? I wish, I wish my life were a Shakespearean uh, problem play, I guess, as it is. Um, but uh, so my book is what they call a biblio memoir, which is to say it talks about how um, the Shakespearean canon interacted with and informed my own life and the lessons I learned from these plays as I was entering adulthood. And um, the Love's Labor's Lost chapter in my book is primarily about a moment in my life when I, which I think a lot of us probably have gone through in our own lives, when I had sexual fantasies or desires that I felt like were bad or wrong. And I was, I had made a resolution to withhold them, shut them down, ignore it, just as the men decide in Love's Labor's Lost, focus on my studies and don't do any of that uh, pervy stuff. Uh, right. But just like it didn't work for the men in Love's Labor's Lost, it didn't work out for me. <laughs> Right. And, and people can uh, check out your book to find out exactly how that manifests itself uh, in your particular situation. Uh, Victoria, you did a, a we spoke about uh, how you did a, a very long run of Love's, Love's Labor's Lost. I tripped over it again uh, off Broadway uh, a year or so ago. Uh, tell us about how that worked out for you. How did you approach uh, that conundrum of the, the four sets of lovers and how they all parallel each other, how they interact with each other? What was that like for you? For you. So very early in our rehearsal process, um, we ended up cutting one of the sets of lovers. We cut Catherine and Dumain because it, um, it, they ended up being, they didn't serve our production and they didn't uh, serve the story we needed to tell. And a lot of people were like, oh, budget cuts, too many actors. And it was like, no, that, that just wasn't necessary because a lot of their lines um, could the, the necessary ones could be given to Longaville and a Mariah. And we didn't want to just have people on stage to have people on stage because we wanted to tell a story of people. The thing that's important to me about this play is, and why I fell in love with it through the rehearsal process is, is also something that's really resonating with me right now is the idea of have fun while you can. You never know when your dad's gonna die. Like, I know that's a really base way of putting it. Like, you never know when the fun's gonna happen, when the fun is gonna have to stop or when it's gonna be over or when it's, you know, and right. to to have the two characters who really weren't serving that. And, and Shakespeare is timeless because it can be adaptable to the times. And so that's the way, the way we needed to adapt it to serve our story. And those, couples telling that story and going that way ended up really being wonderful because then the women could really play as much with the boys as they could. And the princess of France is the one with all of this ping ponging. Um, and I know I played her, so I know a lot of her story more than the most, but she's the one trying to be an adult, trying to be an adult, trying to be adult. And then the last scene, then she finally gets to like have fun. And like I said, gets to you know embrace this time and have fun and then when she finally lets go um it's gone and so I think the the thing of that the toying is you know have fun while you can uh really kind of rang true right. with, um live, live life don't you know don't uh don't go into these vows of you know uh 
uh, celibacy, you know, all, all this, all these uh, ideals that are unattain unattainable. Uh, live, live your life, live for today. Uh, but, but it seems like there, there's, uh, it's more than just that. It seems like if you look at even the fact that it's the princess of France, uh, usually in in Shakespeare's plays, the French are not necessarily represented in the <laughs> brightest light. Uh, in in the Henry plays, uh, the French the French are always the enemies. They're always derided. Uh, they're always uh, uh, the the ones with the silly accents and the you know the uh, it, it's it's not uh, looked upon very well in Shakespeare. But suddenly in Love's Labors, uh, they they're the wiser ones. They are the the more adept ones. The ones that always outwit the the men. Uh, yeah. Is there something in particular about about this character or these these set of characters that makes them stand out as different than other depictions of French? I have a theory, but it's really my theory and based on nothing. Okay. Um, so in the, in 1593, the actual King of Navarre um, came out as Catholic and that was really not good. That was um, frowned upon, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Catholicism was outlawed. Yes, e exactly. And so that was, and, and by 1594, the next year, you know, when we date this 1594 to 1595, mm -hmm. um, so by the next year, he had come back into England's favor and it was okay. But, you know, even though this came out in 1594 to 1595, it could have been, you know, the thoughts of it could have been brewing the, the year earlier. So I think that the French isn't, it's not necessarily that he was looking good on the French when he was writing it. It's that the French were better than Navarre in his mm -hmm. mind at the time. It's that Navarre mm -hmm. was not in a good place. That So the French were okay because Nav Navarre was not. Um, okay, so so it's, it's some kind of reflection of what's happening in the uh, the geopolitical spectrum uh, in England at the time. And we see that in a lot of the plays. Uh, we see that very frequently. Uh, we, we talked about uh, this with uh, our, our friend Cassidy Cash a few episodes ago about uh, Macbeth, where uh, what was happening at that time was that uh, King James I had just come into power. And this was almost a command performance for him uh, to reflect the reality of what had he experienced with the, with the gunpowder plot. Uh, but yeah, so so the the fact that this is in the mid 1590s, and this is towards the the later uh, years of Queen Elizabeth's reign, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Catholicism is outlawed. Uh, Protestantism is uh, very much the the state religion, and uh, Shakespeare uh, and his families are often uh, his family members are often suspect because they are uh, uh, there's insinuations that they have. Uh, Catholic leanings. Uh, so maybe it, this is uh, even before we go to the ascension of James I, maybe still with uh, Elizabeth, there is the necessity for Shakespeare to affirm uh, that he is the proud Protestant and he is not in support of uh, the Catholics. Uh, yeah. but, but, but you're saying that, that uh, the King of Navarre uh, came out as Catholic, so maybe that's why he's depicted as the, the more foolish one or the, the one that, that's uh, uh, outwitted mm. by the French. Yeah, and I can't remember if he was outed or if he came out, forgive me, but I know that in, in 1593 that he was a known Catholic. And I know that, that by the next year he had regained England's favor, but I do think that there was still, you know, there's no way he could have done this play in 1593, but I do think by the next year there was still, you know, he was, he was Catholic, he was silly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, on this topic, uh, Jillian, I'll throw it over to you. Uh, on this topic, we, we, you, you mentioned uh, the idea of the, uh, the vow of celibacy. Uh, and that's something that if we're getting into the realm of the political spectrum of what's happening in, in, in Shakespeare's England at that time, we know that uh, Queen Elizabeth was, uh, her whole thing was that she was the virgin queen. Yeah, she exactly. Was the, so, so where is it we're seeing uh, in some way in this uh, diminution of the King of Navarre character as the, the Catholic, uh, but we're seeing that uh, we're trying to, in some way, shape or form to uplift the, the ideal or, or the paradigm that, that Queen Elizabeth is setting. So how can we go against what she publicly uh, avows as the celibate queen uh, by disavowing that with the characters in the play? Well, I don't necessarily think that 
any anything about Queen Elizabeth was di disavowed or contradicted by the events of Love's Labor's Lost. In fact, if anything, I think the play holds her up as the superhuman ideal, this, um, hmm. you know, this queen among men, this goddess among men, among humans, um, that she is able to attain this, this purity, this kind of celibacy, whereas mere mortals like the characters in the play, they can't possibly live up to the standard that she set. That's a great distinction. That's a great distinction. Mm -hmm. So it's in some way, it's a tip of the hat to her that she here is this, this uh, amazing queen of ours that we all admire and revere that, that is able to do what none of us have the, the strength or the, uh, uh, <laughs> the ability to, to uphold. Absolutely. I don't see it as a rebuke of Queen Elizabeth. If anything, I see it as a, a compliment or an homage to her. Hmm. All right. So, Jill, uh, Jillian, uh, uh, on that, you, you, you sparked a thought. Not, not that I wish to get controversial, but uh, the, the, the whispers, if you will, about Queen Elizabeth at that time was that she was not the Virgin Queen, that she did have affairs and things of that nature. Uh, Shakespeare is brilliant, whoever he is, uh, about, about adding in winks, about adding in little subtexts so that we now, hundreds of years later, get to go, ah, there are two things that, that occur in all his, his sexual comedies, and that's why I'm addressing it to you. In, in this case, do you think it's sort of a wink to the queen? Like, okay, she says she's celibate, period, period, period. Do you think mm. do you think there's anything in there where he's where he's uh, where he's saying okay she says she's celibate but can she really be, and and the second half of my question is Forrest, uh, uh, we see this in Midsummer Night's Dream we see this in Love's Labor's Lost we see this in many of his comedies this is what happens in the city, and then oh let's all get chased into the forest, where all hell can break loose where all right. bets are off. Is there some, some significance, do you think, in terms of, of the forest? Why must they exit into the forest to, to be free, if you will? That's a, that's a really good set of questions, Jay. And, and uh, for me, uh, the, the forest is always, to take the second question first, and we'll, we'll come back to the, the first half uh, in a moment, but the forest is always like, um, the city is the city and it's it's the uh the one that's there's rules there's controls there's there's some kind of policing there's some kind of cultural strictures in the city that that don't exist in the forest the, the forest is in many ways the return to nature the return to an absence of uh control an absence of uh regulation uh so in, in uh as you like it, there is the forest of Arden. In uh, midsummer, you have all the the spirits in the forest, uh, and the the four the four lovers there run into the forest uh, with all their mishaps over there. So I think uh, absolutely the, the same idea holds here that that uh, the the uh, force of the lovers. Uh, yes, they, these are all people from the uh, the upper echelons of society. We have the King of Navarre, you have the Princess of France and their, uh, their colleagues. Uh, but then once uh, they chase each other off into the forest, it's where they intermingle in some ways with the, the low members of society, uh, Custard and Jacquinetta and uh, Don Armado and, and all the clowns, all the buffoons in the play. Uh, so it's, it's a, not only a place where there's less cultural strictures, but it's also a place where different segments of society, different uh, tiers of society can all go and uh, have some kind of level of equality. Jillian, do you think there's like a euphemism somewhere, uh, if you will, because because we were talking, we were, we were talking about curse words right there. And, and most of Shakespeare's curse words, the one that you were, you were so free to say, uh, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard as country matters in Hamlet, he says to lay country matters. Absolutely. Do you think forest uh, uh, and we have so many, we have so many dirty references for trees, for wood, for all of this like that. Do you think Shakespeare was handing us yet another sexy euphemism? So yeah, we want to do this. We want to do this. Where do we go? That's where we go. I mean, I do think Shakespeare found never met a, a dirty pun he couldn't <laughs> resist. Um, so oh, really? I would be I would be very surprised if there aren't uh, extremely dirty forest or wood related puns throughout the canon. And also something that we have to be mindful of here is that Shakespeare, as, as Jillian, as you've referenced in your book, uh, Shakespeare 
uh, isn't playing only to the upper level of society as the characters are represented here. He's also playing to the groundlings. He's playing to uh, the the regular uh, Joe, you know, the... Uh, Absolutely. The... It's just like Jay said. These are soap operas. These are Michael Bay films. These This mm -hmm. is not a highbrow sort of for the elite kind of entertainment. This was right. popular entertainment. And he, you know, right. he knew what the people want and they want you know, sex, drugs, and violence. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And the smug- He just happened to write it in beautiful poetry. <laughs> was it just the people? Right. Was it just the people? Uh, uh, do you think he was, uh, uh, The Simpsons once did a whole uh, uh, commentary, if you will, about commercialism by, by saying their Malibu Stacy doll was brand new, she just had a hat. And, and suddenly at this whole statement about commercialism, do you think Shakespeare is, is giving us sort of a statement about the wealthy that, uh, or, or the upper class, if you will, that, that they too, they want the, the horror film, the lust film, they, they want these uh, things, but, uh, but so they have to be, so these characters have to be in cloaks and wealthy for them to accept them doing all these I, things. I like what you just said, Jay. It reminds me of, uh, I'm sure y'all know those magazines where they've got like the celebrities, they're just like us and like, they pump their cars and they buy groceries. Uh, it kind of makes me feel like Shakespeare is doing a little bit of a, the elite, they're just like us, horny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was gonna say that there's some, some of his comedies that, that are, are, are for lack of a better term, lowbrow. You know, yes, the, the peasant is horny, runs into the forest and there you go. But then there's the princess that's, that's horny. There's the king that's horny. They're running into the forest too. Is it something as simple as adding a cloak to these yeah. <laughs> Say, well, my lord, look, go do what you want. You are already carrying a jeweled cane, so you can. <laughs> but it's more than that. The, the, if you have the low and the high, you have the, the higher uh, echelon of society and the lower echelon of society. But in many ways, not just in this play and others as well, but, but it's very pronounced in this play, the lower echelon of society in many ways is more honest and more uh, a correct version of what people are than the high, uh, highbrow society members. Uh, you have the, the, uh, the clowns, the buffoons, you have Costarda and Jacquinetta, you have even Don, uh, Don Armado, and they, they are fools, they are, we laugh at them, we laugh at their silliness, but they are, at least they're honest. They say what they mean, they mean what they say, and they're very open with their, their affection for each other. Whereas the highbrow members of society uh, who are supposed to be the, the virtuous, the pious, they're the ones who are engaged in the most self-deception and the most uh, deception to one another. So in many ways, uh, the, the simplicity, the, uh, the virtue is with the, the lowbrow members of society here. That's why I asked about the queen. Is it Shakespeare saying, oh, come on, virgin, come. Would he have the temerity to do that? Would he in, imperil oh, himself like he's that? He's so cheeky, though. I mean, he's so yeah. cheeky all the times. But on on your point, Rodney, that is something that's really, really special about this play, which is a reason that um, I love it so much, is that everybody, um, if you're saying a higher class or lower class, like the the kings and the clowns, everybody gets to write. There are so many plays that they're like, well, I can't read this note. You have to read it for me. I'm just a peasant. Um, Castard writes, Don Armado writes, the King of France writes, Varun writes, and they all, the women don't, but um, they get to write notes and everybody can write and everybody can read. And I think that's so special. And it, all the different classes write and, um, and, they've, and they've made this thing about studying in the word. And um, it's, it's so like, it's, it's Shakespeare being a little bit meta about the power of poetry and the power of, of the, his words, because in so many other plays, the peasants can't read or write. And mm. in this one, mm. I think it, it binds all the classes together. And like you said, in a way, the, the sex and the horniness binds the classes together, but this does too. And I think that's really, right. really special. And it also, um, it, it ups the stakes a little bit because they've written down their feelings. Mm. And, and that scene with all of the men, um, you know, they could say, well, I didn't say that about the princess, but um, here they, they can't deny it because they've written it down. Right. I it's think right there. It's you, so know, you, 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 you hit a nail on the head that I've always said that Shakespeare's clairvoyant. Uh, his, his moor is, is a valiant man, not an animal, like, like mm -hmm. one would think. His Jew was not Marlowe's Jew of Malta. It was Shylock. It was a valiant man. Mm -hmm. He is taking these people that should be derided at that time and clairvoyantly shown their their courage 
And, yeah. and it's the same thing here. Back then, yes, everyone was illiterate. And yet, oh my God, on stage, everyone seems to be able to read and write. Mm. So it's very interesting that, that you, you point out the clairvoyancy of Shakespeare. He looked and said, okay, in 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, this is going to be you know, de rigueur that you're able to read and write. Yeah, that's Something. beautiful, Victoria. Thank you for pointing that out. I never thought of that before, but you're absolutely right. There's so much writing and reading in the play. Something else that uh, we, we mentioned along the way there that I want to, to come back to is the idea of the, I, I think maybe Victoria was mentioning it when discussing the idea of the, uh, the people dressed as the Muscovites and uh, the women switching roles. There, there is so much um, disguise uh, that is put on, so many layers of artifice, uh, so many, uh, not, not just uh, the, the, the deception of not being true with uh, their feelings, but literally the, the wearing of masks and costumes and everything else. Uh, what would Shakespeare's audience make of that? Because as it is, you have a little bit of gender confusion with just the way things were structured in that in Shakespeare's day, where you had uh, all males performing. There were no females at that time. You had the men playing men, and you had the female roles being played by young men or boys in some cases. Uh, so if you have the the male actors uh, feigning the being Muscovites, and then you have the women or the young boys uh, sharing each other's disguises, how many layers of artifice are being put on top of each other to make this happen? And, and how would that register with Shakespeare's audience? Mm. Jillian, you seem to be very adept with uh, the knowledge of, of what Shakespeare's audience was like in the day. Uh, have you seen anything about uh, the, in the comedies, this, this trope of the costumes and the disguises and uh, all those additional layers of of chicanery that go on. Uh, how, how is that being received? I think it's a beautiful question. And I think it harkens back to what everyone was saying before about the really transformative and inescapable power of the forest throughout the Shakespearean canon. I think in, in the romantic comedies, like, as you said, as you like it in A Midsummer Night's Dream and even Love's Labor's Lost, the forest is the place where those disguises, that artifice gets stripped away. Um, but I don't think it's isolated to the romantic comedies. I think we even see that in parts of Macbeth and King Lear, the, the natural world is where our inner animals come out and mm. all of those rules and laws and boundaries that society imposes on the characters, all the masks or disguises, if you will, get stripped away. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, Jay, at the very top of the program, you were talking about uh, the folios and the quartos. Uh, so in this particular uh, play, uh, Love's Labors, we have a little bit of a dilemma with that. Uh, we have the folio version of it, and then we also have the existing quarto, and there seems to have been a lost quarto. Uh, does anyone have anything that they uh, would want to share about the, the folios and the quartos? Anyone done any research on that? No, don't get me started. Don't get me started. I'm going to be quiet. Go for no, it, Jay. No, please Go do get go. started, Jay. Yeah. I want to hear it. The, oh, get the, started. The, the discussion is open. Go for it. Uh, yeah. I have not heard. Now, Ben Johnson was the poet laureate of the time. Ben Johnson led the team with, uh, um, uh, 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 I suddenly can't think of the king. Uh, the King James, with King James to rewrite the Bible. Ben Johnson was the, he was the rock star of authors at that time, and nobody tried to copy his work. Uh, Christopher Marlowe was probably the most noticeable author because of his own lascivious ways, because of his own controversial life. And yet no one tried to steal Faustus, which is an amazing piece if you want to talk about stealing something. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a, a huge fan of horror movies. And of course, the moment something becomes public domain, there's 3,700 versions of Dracula that you can go see. Why didn't they steal his Faustus so they could have another devil? Yet Shakespeare's work, there seems to be an abundance of second, third, fifth, quarto, bad folio, fourth folio, etc. And where was Shakespeare at this time? There are records of him suing people for grain. There are records of him in court regarding uh, uh, paying for crops. Where was he to at least write a letter saying, that's not my play? Why don't we see that? All right. Well, well, you're, to kind of rein that discussion in, that's, that's a very big question. To rein it in into the what text that we have, 
we have the folio and then that the folio, uh, the thing generally is that the folio is basically a, a cleaned up version of what exists in the quartos. That the quartos were the, the individual cleaning. who did the cleaning. Who does the cleaning? Uh, for the most part, the, the quartos seem to be the editions that uh, were written down as almost like uh, uh, rough drafts of the plays as they were being written. They're almost and a then, stage manager's edition, if you will, by, by today's standards. Right, right, right. Uh, and then uh, after Shakespeare's death, uh, the, many of the actors from his company assembled the, the sides, the whatever uh, of these uh, stage managers' books, as you might call them, the quartos existed, and they uh, put them all together into the folio edition. Why? Uh, not necessarily only for the preservation of the great works of Shakespeare, but for the commercial aspect of it. Shakespeare was the most popular playwright of his day. He, uh, he was so popular that when King James I ascended and unified England and Scotland, he became the de facto uh, playwright of England. He was the king's, uh, his company were the king's men. He was the, uh, the state playwright. So he was the, the most popular, he generated the most revenue, brought in the biggest audience, and he had the most influence uh, in terms of uh, getting the message that was being transmitted to the audience. So uh, just like any good uh, commercial enterprise, they wanted to get as many dollars out of it as they could. And they said, hey, let's uh, memorialize our, our, our great playwright and let's also publish his works and make a few, uh, a few coins at it in the process. I feel he was like also an upstart crow adorned with others' feathers, but I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry, Victoria, <laughs> you were going to. No, I feel like it was also just um, like it was a bunch of actors who got around and got drunk one night after he was dead, and were just like, <laughs> "This is my fantasy in my head." That they were just like, "Well, here's my sides and here's this," and like they were crying because they missed him, and then they were like d up on the stage and acting it out. Like this is my fantasy that they were just like missing him and drunk and like yes, they wanted. They wanted the cash, but like in my head, like this is the romantic in me that they were just like, oh God, do you remember when we did this scene? It was like this and it was great. And then somebody's writing it down. Like that's just how I wanted it to be. And it actually, they're just like, okay, it was probably this. But like, I just have this beautiful dream of how it actually was. Um, and yeah, I don't know where I was going. That, you know like, what, you're how... all saying something very interesting to me. And I, I, I ask this, this ignorant question, if you will, which came first? The fairy tale or Shakespeare? That's a good question. In many cases, we know that Shakespeare, his works derive from pre-existing stories. Oh, uh, yeah. There's clear lineage yeah. between uh, many of the plays and a direct uh, antecedent that comes from Italian writers, from uh, from. Uh, some Roman plays, some uh, from uh, the Bible, in some cases from straight from history, from uh, from uh, the works of uh, who's the one with the um, uh, the 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 transformations. I, I, it starts with the M. It's 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 on the tip of my tongue, but it's escaping me. But we we know for sure that he uh, there there's a great derivation of of much of his work. But it's not just that he came up with the idea or didn't come up with the idea. It's the, the ideas. You you could argue that the same four plays are repeated. Uh, ad nauseum uh, in the entirety of the the world of writing and theater, but it's how you put that on the page. It's how right. you make that happen. That that makes it different than everybody else. I mean, the, there's you're you're asking why Ben Johnson and Christopher Marlowe, who also wrote plays uh, with Volpone and with uh, Faustus and Marlowe and and, and uh, the Jew of Malta and everything else, why theirs uh, are not held with the same regard and and written in so many editions. And we examine the folio and the quarto. It's not that they are were inferior playwrights. It's that they were less popular. He, he, he was the most popular playwright of the day. Even if you look at what's contemporary in Hollywood right now, uh, you, you'll take, uh, they're not going back and remaking Dead Poets Society, which is a wonderful movie. They're remaking uh, Transformers and they're remaking, because whatever, the uh, Fast, Fast and Furious. Why? It's not because Fast and Furious is the poet laureate of the era. It's because it brought in a lot of dollars and people like things that blow up and look cool. You know, so that's, that's pretty much what it was. It's, it's Shakespeare was the, the popular, but he was also the, what makes him so transcendent is that he was popular and it was uh, an amazing, emotionally shaded uh, version of the, the work.
He, he also seemed to tap a lot of subjects. One thing about the conspiracy is they, they say the person who wrote these plays knew everything about everything when you really get <laughs> down to it. And, and I'm, I'm asking both of you now, in, in, uh, uh, Victoria and Jillian and, and Rodney, need, Rod, Rodney, needless to say, I want, I want to hear what you have to say about this. Where did the notion of the enchanted forest come in? Every, every children's story Somewhere you go into the enchanted forest. Now, did Shakespeare give us that with these, with these romantic pieces where in order for love to bloom and individuality to happen, they have to run into the forest? Did, did, did the fairy tale grab Shakespeare or did Shakespeare grab the fairy tale? I'm at a loss here, Jay. I thought that was Walt Disney's invention. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's why we love both. Maybe we don't need to know where the enchanted forest came from. Um, because it's just, it's always been. We've always had the enchanted forest. I think, um, no, I, you know, I, I, and I think this is something I've always missed, uh, not always missed, since the age of like Google, I've missed uh, ending conversations and I don't know. And maybe this is the joy of in this moment. I can't look it up. That that may I I don't know, but I think it's really lovely that we we do have this enchanted forest, and that we do have the forest of Arden and the forest in Midsummer, and and here and and that it is something mystical, like you said, and like like Sondheim. We have the the moments in the wood, and because it is, it's this place that we can escape to, and um, I think that we all. We, we all long to escape, especially right now. You know, I'm in my one bedroom apartment in Manhattan. I, I want my enchanted forest. I mean, if, if you really want to push the idea of the, the uh, enchanted forest, you can go all the way back to the Bible, to, to creation and the idea exactly, of the, Garden, the, the of Garden of Eden. Oh, that's great. You, you, can, you can push that's it all the way back to there right. where, where it's this, this mystical, uh, wonderful, uh, idyllic place that, uh, the, if only we can get back to there, if only we can get back to this mystical land and, and it's so enchanted. And if we could just get just get past that threshold of, of our limitations, we could only, of our sin, of our whatever, whatever the, the religious context of it is, we can get back to this, this mystical, magical land. I think it's- It's, it's a oh, mystical, it's magical place that once again gets ruined by giving into appetite. Jillian, considering your book, do you think that, that we're getting a little, uh, a wink again from, from Shakespeare because the whole, one of the huge, once, once Eve, once Eve decides that fruit is healthy, uh, we, we get the notion that they suddenly realize they are naked. And once they're naked, they have to leave the forest. They have to leave uh, uh, this enchanted forest. Do you think this is a biblical nod in Shakespeare's way to, to show us you know, okay, you, 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 all, you all have your intelligence. You all are writing, even though reality says you're not. You are all dressed, you're all whatever. But if we really want to get back to what's in here, we have to go back to the Garden of Eden to find it. We have to go back to when we didn't care if we were dressed. I do imagine that Shakespeare's England was a place, and I think it's more than my imagination. I think this is pretty well borne out in history. Um, was a place with a lot of rules, also with in some ways a lot of um, freedom, but but like a lot of rules, a lot of social structures about what people were allowed to do and who they were allowed to associate with and what they were allowed to believe, certainly um, in terms of religion. And I so I think that the idea of getting to escape to the forest to follow your appetites and do what you want and be, let's say figuratively or perhaps literally naked if you want to be. Um, it was kind of like a return to the Garden of Eden in some ways and this uh, the return to this unencumbered, totally idyllic, completely free version of reality that I don't think a lot of people in, in that time or even today uh, got to indulge in. We, we spoke a little bit earlier about the all the layers of costumes and artifice. Maybe that plays into what we're talking about now. Maybe when you strip away all of that artifice, all of those uh, masks, and you get to the, the naked reality of who the people are and the expression of love and the expression of uh, honesty, maybe that is the, the return to this idyllic uh, land that we're all trying to get to. And, and Rodney, between you and, and Victoria's fantasy, uh, uh, it, it really makes this huge sense. It's, yes, of course, his actors, fellow authors, producers, whomever, they picked up his plays and they adored them. 
And they said, no, this is too good. You know what? I'm going to change Carambus to Polonius because that sounds better. I'm going to have this person die <laughs> instead. I think that this person should come into this scene. They, they went back to their own enchanted forest with his plays. And as there was no copyright dealings there, they did Absolutely. what they wanted. Hence other quartos, hence other folios. Hence people picking up a play and saying, I love this play so much, it must be by William Shakespeare. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely, wow. right. And and there is there is some suggestion about that. I, I know this is something that you like to uh, to delve into very deeply, Jay. That that in the later years, especially when they came into the uh, the later folios, that some of the uh, right, there's 36 canonical plays of Shakespeare. But if you uh, look at all the apocrypha, maybe there's another 20 or 25 plays that at various points in history have been attributed in some way, shape, or form to Shakespeare. And there's a lot of suggestion that many of those later plays were the works of authors uh, who maybe just slap the name Shakespeare on just to get a little bit of an additional uh, boost to their, their ticket sale, so to speak. Uh, so there, there is that possibility out there. It's Including, like of course, a alleged sequel to Love's Labor's Lost called Love's Labor's One. So. Right. What, I, you know, I've heard about that, right. but I never did any I didn't think that's to that. much to do about nothing, though. <laughs> okay, see, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm in that canon. But that's cool. I, I believe it. I can, I can, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a team myself, but I've heard that theory. I've heard other theories and, you know, who knows? It's, it's great. It's all good. That's but I'm so also on, on team Pericles. I would like to <laughs> say, you know, who wrote what? I'm very much on team Pericles. I am a huge Pericles fan. <laughs> but but uh, Jillian, what you referenced about uh, Love's Labor's Lost uh, and the, the supposed sequel of Love, Love's Labor's One, that hits into uh, one of the, the ideas that we were uh, going to grapple with tonight, which is the idea that Love's Labor's is viewed by many as a problem play of Shakespeare. Uh, and why is that? It, simply because the, 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 of the basic idea that the dramas, the tragedies all end with everyone dying, and the comedies, the romances, all end with everyone getting married. So you have that that non-resolution, that that uh, that uh, unsatisfying ending where the four sets of lovers, uh, although they all have admitted that they love each other, because of the circumstance that arrives with the uh, the death of the king of France, the father of the princess, uh, that that resolution never comes. Uh, what what is it about that? that uh, not having that ending point on it makes it so problematic for us. Is it that we, we need that neat resolution? We need that the gamos of the multiple marriages. Uh, it's, it's not satisfying the, of the come back next time and see what happens. I mean, I definitely personally can say that, you know, it, it is always frustrating whether it's Shakespeare or, you know, uh, HBO series when something ends on a cliffhanger and there's no next episode or next season or next play. And I do think Love's Labor's Lost ends on a, on a cliffhanger. Um, I love the play, but always at the end, I kind of wish there was just a little bit more, just a little bit more. So for me, that's the, uh, the frustration. It's not, um, it's not any indictment of the play. It's just a desire for more. For, do you think right. it's that there's more clairvoyance again for, for our buddy Bill? that he's basically saying these women are smarter than we allowed women to be then. And they said, Victoria, just as you aptly said in your, in your description of the show, uh, uh, they said, okay, look, you guys can't keep vows. What, we're gonna marry you and, get, and you're gonna try to keep that vow? Do we get the idea that Shakespeare's saying women are too smart for these yokels? Oh, I think most of Shakespeare's women are, uh, I think they're out of the league of Shakespeare's men. Just look at Rosalind and Orlando and that's, that, that oh, tells you everything you need to know. For heaven's sake. You know, look at uh, the Beatrice and Benedict, like it's, they're all, all of them. I'm so with you, Julia. <laughs> Rodney, I, people treat this play like it's Infinity War. They're like, it's, it's, it's totally an unsatisfying <laughs> ending, like it's terrible. <laughs> And I feel like um, I'm totally with you, Jillian, that it's it's unsatisfying, but I do think that you can, it has to be directed properly. And like, of course I think that I did. Um, <laughs> I didn't like that would be wrong of me, right? But I think that you have to deal with it in a way that you can lean into the, the theme of like live while you can because you never know what is next if you direct it like a, that's the end, because it is the end, like, of course, that's terrible. Like, that's not how you want to end a play. But if you can lean into 
live while you can because life can be bittersweet sometimes. I think that it it can be really lovely um, that like, mm. you're just like, oh, okay. Um, and that I think it's okay to leave your audience unsatisfied if you leave them, like you, you can't leave them wanting more play, but you can leave them a little unsettled and thinking about it. Thank yeah, you. it leaves Thank you, you with a lot of food for thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think and that I leads us to a natural endpoint for our discussion. We want to leave the audience wanting more of these wonderful participants, <laughs> of Jillian <laughs> and, and her book, Sex with Shakespeare, of Victoria and Food of Love Productions and their upcoming, uh, what do you call it? Is it, is it, uh, some of Valentine's Day? Text messages. <laughs> ah, very exciting. And uh, v Victoria, where can people sign up or, or where can they check you guys out to sign up for those text messages? Yes, um, you can follow us on Twitter, which is just Food of Love NYC, or at our Facebook, which is Food of Love Productions, but you can get the sonnets at foodoflovproductions.com. Fantastic. And Jillian, once again, if people want to find you to connect with you, or they can go to Amazon to find your book, where can they uh, connect with you? I'm also on Twitter at Jillian Keenan. That's really the best place to find me. <laughs> That's the best way. All right. And uh, Jay, where can people connect with you with all your content? Uh, you can easily find me. I'm, I'm now, uh, I'm now uh, um, putting up content for uh, on YouTube, uh, JMC Channel I, which is the independent channel for independent theater and film, where such things as these interviews happen, as well as independent films are being played there, and stage works that have either been Zoomed or recorded previously are shown on there. So we are the channel for the independent artist. Uh, you can go to jmichaelsarts.com and all the links are there uh, to go and see all of these programmings. And ladies, thank you both. And Rodney, all three of you, thank you so much. You have so educated me, firstly on this play, but also it gave me so much food for thought for my little journey about where all those other plays came from and who is this guy or this girl or this group of people called William Shakespeare. You've given me such food for thought. <laughs> of course, food for, of course you would give me food. Uh, food for thought. thought from Food of Love Productions. So, so <laughs> they, they you feed your mind, they feed your body, they feed everything. There you go. Right. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. It's been a, a really great hour of discussion and we look forward to uh, sharing this with our audience and you'll be able to find this online very soon. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Ciao.